From the pulpit of the Capital City Baptist Church, we present Pulpit Echoes, a ministry of Pastor Adam Thompson and the Capital City Baptist Church. I'd invite you to stay with us because at the end of the broadcast, we'll give you our contact information. And now with a message from the Word of God, here's Pastor Adam Thompson. Joshua 1 verse 8. Very familiar text of the Bible says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, then shalt thou have good success. I want you to focus on those three words found in the middle of the verse. Thou shalt meditate. I want you to consider this tonight. You might say, preacher, I know this verse. I know this verse by memory. I know the command to meditate, and I must confess that I grew up in church. I memorized this verse as a young kid growing up in church. I don't remember if it was Sunday school or the Christian school. And because I'm a preacher and started preaching at the age of 13, uh, in order to preach, there's a lot of meditation on Scripture that takes place. Years ago, I stopped reading my Bible through from Genesis to Revelation, and I started reading it a book at a time, and sometimes those books uh, I would spend literally a month and read it a hundred times, 50 to a hundred times over to help my meditation. But I, I will tell you tonight, I think for the very first time in my life, 47 years of living, that this week I have grasped the meaning of biblical meditation. I think for a long time I've missed it. Now, culture, obviously, what we hear from our culture, yoga, conscious breathing, and whatever Christians are doing when they skip a Sunday and go out to the lake or go out to the woods and meditate on the fish and the deer is not exactly what the Scripture is talking about. What are we to meditate Upon is very obvious here. There's no confusion in the text. This book of the... What are we supposed to meditate on? This book of the law. This book right here, God's law. And now here's the problem. Most of our meditation, we all meditate on something, but most of our meditation is upon sports, politics, frustrations with other people, life's problems or things we shouldn't be meditating upon at all. Go with me tonight to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, and deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now, consider this. This is before radio. This is before TV. This is before the eye gates and the ear gates were bombarded by technology. It says, that righteous man dwelling among them in, what's it say? Seeing and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul from day to day. Why? Because those two gates will determine our meditation. What you set your eyes upon, what you open your ears to, determines what you meditate upon. This is why it's so important when you're driving to work, especially in Austin traffic, and the drive is long, you predetermine your meditation upon the law of God and not upon the condition of our country or the condition of society or the latest on the sports news. None of that is going to challenge you, help you, or spiritually motivate you to do that which is right. You've got to say, I'm going this morning and every morning, establish the habit, putting in my earbuds or, or playing the tape. There, We have so much access now to the Word of God. How many remember the old tapes by Alexander Scorby. Now these kids don't even know what we're talking about when we talk about tape. They think that's masking tape or something you use to seal a box. No, I'm talking about a piece of plastic they used to play music. Then they went to CDs. And now kids don't even know what those are. But Lot was vexing his soul with the what? The filthy conversation. What he was hearing and seeing was vexing his soul because what you see and what you hear will be your meditation. Now, go back with me to Joshua 1.8. This is meditation. What's it say? This book of the law 
shall not depart out of thy mouth. We've thought meditation was the mind. Scripture says meditation is the mouth. How do we meditate? You know, for years, I think, Christianity, we've seen in this generation the cultivation and now the reaping of what we planted, what we had sown years ago in our independent fundamental Baptist churches where there's a lot of preaching, little emphasis on a personal walk with God. So we were telling people to read their Bibles. And normally people get up and they would open up a book of the Bible and we'd even give them reading lists, pre-established Bible reading lists, how they could read their Bible in a year, and they would mark it off. How many of you have had one of those lists you marked it off right through your Bible? The problem was, let's just be honest tonight, much of Bible reading has no purpose at all. Let me repeat that. I know that's disturbing to say it in a fundamental Baptist church. How many of you ever read and your mind was not there? But you finished your devotions. You marked it off the list. You had finished your duty. You got your 15 minutes in, your 20 minutes in, maybe your 30 minutes in. But you could look back on your year and say, I read through the word of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But your meditation was still on the Dallas Cowboys, Texas Longhorns, President Trump, or whatever else you'd been listening to, whatever else you opened your eye gate, your ear gate to. Very little meditation in Christianity is upon the Word of God, upon the law of God. Now, here's what we know what your meditation is. Those cowboys, I hate those, I can't believe. They still don't have a good quarterback. When are they ever going to get back to some? That is meditation because it's a continual muttering and a mumbling. You know what meditation is according to the Scripture? It's a muttering. It's a mumbling. So we miss the very first step. We get up, and when we get in this book, instead of saying, I need a meditation for today. Holy Spirit, I want you to speak to me. I want you to work in my heart. I want you to convict me of my sin. I want you to show me something. So I'm going to read. I'm not trying to mark off three chapters or six chapters or ten pages or 15 pages. I'm not impressed by the amount of pages that you read per day. I'm not impressed by the amount of chapters that you read per day. There's a scriptural principle here that is meditation, and I would say the majority, when I say majority, 70, 80, possibly 90 percent fundamental, independent, Bible-believing Christians have never ever understood or obeyed the command to meditate upon his law. And if you're not a preacher, you're not even forced into a spot where you have to meditate. I preach on the average 12 times a week. Guess what I have to do? I have to meditate. Years ago, I determined my devotions are not something I do in the morning and chuck it off. My devotions are something I do all day long. If I'm not progressively studying, I'm not at a point in my ministry because of school and Bible Institute and meetings and church and Spanish church and everything else I do, I cannot now block off six or eight or ten hours of study time at a time. So my study has to be progressive throughout the day and I have a half an hour here and I have an hour here and I have an hour and a half over here and I take those blocks of time and over the course of the week I have 25 hours that I may be able to study, maybe 30 hours that I, but it's never hours solely dedicated, separated like a Christian is supposed to be from the world. But my meditation has to be all day long. Now, your life is very different than a pastor's life. You're not preaching. Most of you don't even teach in a Sunday school class or do anything that requires Bible study or meditation. So if you're not careful, you're getting in the habit of saying, okay, there's a Christian duty, and I understand I'm supposed to pray, I'm supposed to sow, and I'm supposed to tithe, I'm supposed to attend church, I'm supposed to read my Bible. So every day I set apart my 15 minutes, and I go through my text, and I mark it off, and I've fulfilled my duty as a born-again child of God. There's a problem. It has nothing to do with meditation because your mind was filled all day long with other things, everything but the Word of God. And only when we're reading the Word of God, it's still not meditating on the law of God. So in the morning you wake up and you say, I'm going to read this text, and I'm going to read slowly, and I'm going to make sure before I finish, I have something from God that is going to be my meditation all day long. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to mutter it on my way to work. I'm going to mutter it. I'm going to mumble it. 
and I'm going to mutter it through the morning. I'm going to mumble it throughout the day. I'm going to look a little bit strange. Someone may say, that person's talking to himself. Maybe he's lost his mind. He's forgotten his medication. He doesn't know where he's at. He needs some help. For the first time in my life, I begin to spend my day muttering. My meditation is muttering. Go with me to Isaiah 59. According to the Bible, Isaiah 59, look what it says in verse 3. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips. Now we're talking about the world, the meditation of their heart, and we understand what the Bible says. The imagination of their heart is only evil continually. We understand that. Why, why are their hands defiled with blood and their fingers with iniquity and their lips with lies? Look what it says. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness because their meditation, their muttering was perverseness. So when they woke up, they began to think upon their iniquity and they mumbled it and they meditated upon it until they did it. Now, here's what God wants us to do with his law. Obey it, heed it, live it. You know how that happens? When we're taking the word of God, now let me ask you this. When was the last time you say, in my day, start off my day, and I got a daily meditation. I didn't read my Bible just to read it, mark it off my list, my spiritual to-do list, but I literally got something from God, and for the rest of my day, I chewed on that. I saturated myself in that. I mumbled it. And I muttered it. And then I spoke it. That began to me to Psalms chapter 66 and Psalm 77. We'll look at several texts simultaneously tonight. Look what it says in Psalm 77 verse 11. I will remember the works of the Lord... That's meditation. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work. And what? It's the same thing. Meditation is talking of thy doings. So here's what I'm challenging you to do to be scriptural and to say, okay, it doesn't help me at all if I'm simply trying to fulfill my spiritual requirements. We've done that too often. We've done that without purpose. We've done that where it provided no spiritual benefit to us, and we've taught our children to do that to a point where there's no spiritual benefit for them. And guess what happens? The Word of God, instead of being alive and life-changing, instead of God speaking to them, as soon as they get the opportunity to quit, they will. Mom may bring them down to the table and say, I want you to read this book. So they sit there tortured by the 15 minutes as they look at the pages and turn them one at a time. But God's not speaking to them. They're not speaking to God. And they leave with no meditation. But if we learn to teach our children, there is something in that book that God wants to teach you today. You wrap your mind around it. You underline it. You highlight it. You write it down. And the rest of the day, you meditate. You mumble and mutter it. Because if it's not coming out of your mouth, it's not staying in your heart or head. Guess who's paying the most attention tonight to this message? The man that's speaking it. You're missing moments. You may miss, be missing long moments. You may miss the whole thing. You're going to get distracted at some point during the service by the person sitting next to you or by a problem that you're supposed to solve tomorrow by an obligation that you have this week. But I'm not getting sidetracked by the problems that I've got on my plate because my mind is controlled by my muttering. My mumbling is my meditation. Now, some of you ladies ought to be very good at the art of meditation. How many kids have seen your mother mumble or mutter? Those kids, I'll tell you what, I can cook and clean and clean and cook and up and down. Sick and tired. She's meditating. She's meditating on the fact that she's angry with her kids. If I were you, I would hide. That's a good time to find a place to hide. That's where you hope you have a big yard and you go play. You climb on a bike and you ride. <laughs> we're sidetracked. Where are we at in the message? Number, number one, we're to meditate day and night on this book. That means literally marinating. How many of you ever marinated something? 
What do you do with that piece of meat? Brother Jeremy is a professional chef. What do you do with that meat? You baptize, you saturate it, you soak it, you leave it in there so by the time you take it out, it has that flavor permanently indwelling. That's what we want to do with the Word of God. That's why you take one verse, one truth. Sometimes, maybe, if you're in the book of Matthew or over the life of Christ, certain passages of Scripture, you can meditate upon an event. You can meditate upon an entire chapter. But for the most part, you better pick a truth, a principle, a verse, just one. that will help you for the moment, help you for the day. And if God's not speaking to you and if you're not listening, go to your concordance, find one on your present sin and just memorize that one. Here's what we have to do. We have to slow down and read this book more carefully. Now, if we were honest tonight, I don't need to show our hands. Most Christians would have to admit that a lot of their Bible reading has not been fruitful, helpful, productive, more tiresome, bothersome than helpful because the purpose was not established from the beginning. This isn't about you getting through a chapter or even through a book. This is about God's word getting through you. You've got this in reverse. God doesn't need you to get through it. Through it means you're trying to finish. God's not trying to finish. He's trying to get a work started in your heart, and he does that through your meditation. You know who people are that come walk forward and kneel down at this altar? Those are people that meditated on the word of God, and it produced fruit in their heart. You ought to listen to it. We're in 2018. You ought to listen to the word of God. I don't even know, as we've studied through the book of Joshua, how many times I have listened. I can every day, at least once a day, listen to the entire book. I've listened to the Bible so much now, randomly. You could start your Bible audio randomly in the Bible, and most likely I could get within a chapter or two of where it's at. You're just saturating yourself. You know what you're doing? You're taking a wandering mind, you're bringing it back to where it's supposed to be. Meditation on the law of God. Now, how, how much and when are we supposed to meditate? Because God establishes extremely large boundaries. Look what it says in Psalm 63. He said, meditate day and night. Now, this doesn't mean you become a monk. Amen? Baptist monk. Uh, you have things to do. You have obligations, responsibilities. You'd get fired if you did this 24-7. But here's what you can do. Every opportunity during the day or night, you refocus your mind on the Word of God. Pastor, that seems a little excessive, not in God's mind. Psalm 63, verse 4. How many of you, when you read through Psalms, you ever pay attention to the, the title and the heading? Of the chapter. Now, this is David. He's fleeing from Saul. And look what he says, Psalm 63, verse 4. Thus will I bless thee while I live. Because he didn't know how much longer he was going to live. He knew Saul was a very mighty warrior with a big spear. And his purpose in life at this moment was to kill, to take the life of David. I'll lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness. My mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Look what it says. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. You know what David was doing? He was traveling with a band of man, and they would rotate the night watch. And David said, when it's my time to stand watch, I'm meditating on your law. That's day or night. Let me ask you this. It would help you calm down if at night when you can't sleep, you med made your meditation the law of God instead of that extremely large problem that you have to solve tomorrow. It will even help your marriage if your marriage isn't doing well and you can't sleep. You can say, I'm going to meditate 
on the Word of God instead of meditating on the failures of this person. You want to know how to lose your mind? You just meditate on other people's failures. You want to keep your hair. You want to keep your mind. You want to keep your sanity. And David said, here's how I'm keeping my sanity. Although I'm fleeing from Saul, I'm keeping my mind because my focus, my meditation, my mumbling, my muttering is not about Saul. It's not about the problem I have. It's about my great God. Meditation is the spiritual stomach by which we digest and assimilate spiritually the word of God. That's what meditation is. It's your spiritual stomach. You know what you got? You know how long you're going to live without a stomach? You need that to digest and assimilate food, and so you need meditation to digest the Word of God. Psalms 1 2. I believe some of these will be on the screen, possibly. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, what do we meditate upon? That which we delight in. If you delight in sports, that'll be your meditation. If you delight in pornography, that'll be your meditation. If you delight in shopping, that'll be your meditation. If you delight in politics, that will be your meditation. But God's command is, his delight shall be what? In the law of the Lord. In his law doth he meditate when? Once again, day and night. Psalms 119, verse 15. I will meditate in thy precepts. And have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself. Here's what you're going to see. Meditation and delight. These two words are joined at the hip. I will not forget thy word. How does that happen? Through meditation. Psalms 119, 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation. You know it. What's it say? All the day. Now, can we say that in honesty? Can we say... God's word is my meditation. All day. How many ready to jump up and say, preacher, I want to tell you something. I want to give you a testimony. God's word is my meditation all the day. I need a testimony. Anybody want to testify? Are you with me tonight? If, if I can just get one person jump up and say, my meditation is the word of God all day, starting from beginning to end. I'm going to tell you a secret. As much as I have to preach and teach, as much as I need that book, as much as I'm with people and I have to counsel, there are times during my day when it's not my meditation. Now, you would think someone that's been a Christian as long as I've been in my spot with my responsibilities could easily make it their meditation. There's a problem here. Satan doesn't want you to live it. So Satan doesn't want you to think upon it. He wants you to think upon Traffic is awful. Traffic is horrible. I can't believe that guy cut me off. That guy's swerving around. I think she's on her cell phone. I wonder if I should dial 911. I can't believe she's going to tell in that. That's our meditation. You've got to be kidding me. You're standing there at the grocery store. You're waiting in line. You, no, this is express line. You do not have 15 items in your car. You have at least 42. Are you blind? I had to come up there and slap you upside the head. You could, at least, you could at least be considerate enough to grab your stuff, put it in your cart, and move around. Because people like me that are important, I'm in a hurry. You got to make room for people that are important and truly in a hurry. I've only got seven items. I can't believe you're holding this up. I'm going to be late for my coffee appointment because you won't take your items to another. Oh, don't tell me the price scan. Don't tell me. Oh, Lord have mercy. I'm going to lose my Christianity. That's the value of our meditation. Priceless. I can't believe my boss talks to me like that. I should be making 45, 50 bucks an hour. He's paying me 25 with my value to this company. I'm going to tell him what he is. One of these days, when it's my time to go, I'm going to walk in that office, I'm going to open that door with a smile on my face, and say, I'm leaving, but before I'm leaving, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I don't have much to give him, but I'm going to give him a piece. <laughs> He's going to know what I think of this company. He's going to know what I think of him and his business practices. I'm surprised this company can even run with a low IQ like that. How did he ever get that position? Should we talk about our meditation? God wants to replace that with this book. 
something that would honor and please and help us during the day in our families, our homes, our ministries, with our children, in our marriage. Leaders meditate. How many of you have been to the self-help section of a bookstore? Brother Sisson, who I'm going to preach for in the Philippines here in a couple weeks, used to always say, leaders are readers. Boys, how many books did you read this week? You know why? Because leaders meditate. Leaders meditate on the right things. Character, your character is determined by your meditation, what you meditate upon. Character starts with our thoughts. What happens to our thoughts? They become our words. Our words become our actions. Our actions over time become our habits. That's why our meditation determines our character. That's why, ladies, you got to be careful. Ladies, you got to be very careful. Your meditations are revealed in your texts and your phone conversation, your conversations. And when you live frustrated, everyone else constantly gets to hear about it. I don't care what you're frustrated about, who you're frustrated about. I think more than anything, you're frustrated that you turn 40 or 45 or 50 or 55 or 60. You better get over it because it's going to keep happening. The cakes are going to keep coming. The candles are going to keep growing. Your meditation should not be your aches, your pains, your neighbors, your problems, your health issues, your blood pressure, your cholesterol. It ought to be about something that's greater than that that has a calming influence. It's amazing how much our meditation affects us. Miss Sarah back there works at Dale's Children's Hospital. Sarah, tell me what happens when someone comes in there to have their blood pressure checked. It's you, see, 120 over 80. But they sit down, and Sarah says, I'm going to check your blood pressure. And it spikes. You know what? It was perfectly normal until their meditation became, oh, no, where's it going? What are they going to say? Are they going to try to put me on medication or not? And psh, I tell them when they take my blood pressure, I say, listen, take it three times. Because I walked in here angry. <laughs> and now you spiked it. I'm going to focus on all the good that I have going in my life. And by the time you get around to the third time, it's going to be right back to where it's supposed to be. Amen? How many tell me that's not the truth? Because when you walk up to the... The doctor's office, first thing they say is, I know how much you're paying for your insurance, but your insurance isn't going to cover this visit. Yeah. What? $800 a month and it doesn't cover you checking my blood pressure? Yeah, that messes up your meditation. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 12. This is the world. And ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, uh, look what it says. You walk every one after the what? The imagination of his evil heart. This is repeated several occasions in the Bible, but specifically here in Jeremiah. Here's what you don't want to do. You want to make sure that you don't allow anything into your mind or be a part of your meditation that would hinder your walk with God. That can't, that can't be part of my meditation. How many of you find yourself allowing, because you're bombarded, ear gate and eye gate, every day you allow things into your mind that shouldn't be there. They become, here's the problem, it's not just that they go in, but they stick around. They stay longer than they're supposed to stay. They become part of your meditation. What Psalms 1914 say, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be what? Be acceptable. Be what? Let's say it all together. Be what? Acceptable, Acceptable in whose sight? In thy sight. Philippians 4, 8 ought to be a filter for our meditation. What's it say? We'll get it up here on the screen. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good, Hold on. This isn't the kind of report you get on Facebook, text message, cell phone. Good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think, meditate, focus, mumble, mutter about these. Now, what are you mumbling about? This is your filter. 
This is your filter right here, spiritual filter. This is a command. So filter your thoughts through Philippians 4.8. Man, you'd run out of things to think upon. <laughs> what are you thinking about? Nothing? I mean it this time. <laughs> if they're lovely, if they're pure, if it's a good report, if it's honest. I'm not talking about honest because it came out of your mouth and you deemed it honest. I'm talking about literally fitting the category of being truthful. You could even read the news in this day and age. How many times you heard something, you repeat it, and then you found out it wasn't true? I've learned now, oh, I just wait. I've gotten calls about people this week, Brother West and his health situation, Brother Dawson and his stroke, and, and I say, you know what, I need to verify that, and can you make another call, and you make another call and talk to this person, because second and third hand information just gets so twisted. And I gotta filter what comes into my mind. I gotta filter what comes into my thoughts. Let me ask you this. Can you say, you, you know what happens when you're thinking about those things that are right, true, just, lovely, and pure, good report? There's a sparkle in your eye, and there's, there's, your countenance is just pleasant. Now, what happens when you're thinking about things that, sh that should have been filtered, but they weren't? Yeah, we've seen the look before. We know the look. It's stern. It's angry. It's upset. It's depressed. It's frustrated. It's ugly. It's tense. What do I do, Pastor? I change my meditation. Thou shalt meditate upon what? This book, this law. That means anything that's not pleasing God should be filtered out. Guess what happens when you're not filtering it out? Depression is based upon the wrong meditation. Lust is based upon the wrong meditation. Anger is based upon the wrong meditation. You know, it happens with a lot of expectations in life. A lot. Job, people, marriage, kids, you name it. Work, income, whatever it is. We just expect things to go a certain way. So in our mind, we establish all our expectations. That's what we begin to meditate upon. And then as we live our life and people fail to meet our expectations, hyperventilate. You meditate on God. You know what God's Word tells you? People are going to fail. <laughs> That's a given. You got to focus on his goodness, and uh, instead of people's badness, it'll help you out. You need to get your filter to be active. 2 Corinthians goes with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity, what? So our meditation should only be that which is biblical, that which is based on the law of God. Every thought has to be brought into captivity and control. Number three, when we meditate on this book, our lives are transformed. Here's what he said. Then shalt thou have what? How many want to have good success? Now, you know why God put in there good success, because you've seen the world and you've seen their success to them means one area of life. Maybe that means football field. Maybe that means they're a good receiver. They beat their wives, mistreat their families, have children by eight different women. But to them, good success meant 10 years of football and a large salary that came from the NFL. That we know that's not termed biblically good success. Good success is multidimensional. That means you're successful as a husband, as a Christian, as a father, as a leader, as a ministry leader, as an employee, as a co-worker, as a friend, as a son. Good success. You know how we do that? By meditating. God has given us guidelines and instructions so that we can follow his word and be successful. Now, how do you live a godly life? How, how many of you can see in today's Christianity, obviously people are not meditating on the law of God because there's a, a, an obvious lack of godliness among those that call themselves Christians. How can you meditate on this book and not be godly? Thy word have I in my heart that I might not... What's it mean to hide his word in my heart? I'm hearing it. I'm meditating upon it. I'm memorizing it. And now I'm mumbling it. Guess what? His words in my heart. What's happened? Now that I might not sin against the most church-going Christians, you ask them to quote a verse. 
they'd stumble around. You ask them about the batting average of Mike Trout, and they could tell you in five seconds. You ask them about uh, the record of their professional football team last season, and they could tell you immediately. They can tell you about the political strife and the political problems of the day and the latest news, but if you ask them to find a verse or quote you a verse out of Psalms, they'd he and they'd ha, and they'd have to give up and turn around and walk away. I love chapel every Thursday. Come down here, and normally we start off with some games and some fun. A lot of times I'll say, hey, someone quote me a verse out of the book of Colossians. And I have seven people raise their hand, and kids will begin to say verse. I'll say, quote me a verse out of Ecclesiastes. And they'll quote me a verse. Out. We can get it verses out of Ecclesiastes and Revelation and Genesis. And then after I got everybody on board, and they're shouting and screaming, and everybody's trying to say, quote me a verse out of Song of Solomon. And there's... Silence. It's not a bad thing, amen. <laughs> but it does me good to know that these kids are memorizing scripture. They ought to be meditating on it and mumbling it and muttering it, but that's not something just that's good for kids, it's good for adults. It'll keep you holy. You got to know the mind of God. This is the mind of God. Obviously, those that don't live holy lives are not meditating on this book because holiness, holiness, holy living is the result of meditating upon this book. Look what it said in Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews 8, verse 10. This is God's desire for his people. Now, I know this is speaking of the Jews and his new covenant with the Jews, but this is his ultimate desire for his people. Look what it says, verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. Here's a new covenant. Now we know this isn't going to happen until the millennium. But this is God's desire. His law be in their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor. And every man and his brother was saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the last, from the least to the greatest. He said, I'm going to ingrain on them. This is the way God wants the earth to run and his people to function. With his law ingrained on their hearts, their minds. Now, how do we do that? Let's do God a favor. You know what sanctification is about? We know what sanctification is threefold. The initial step happens at salvation, sanctified in his eyes. The second step is being sanctified before men, living a holy life. We grow in sanctification. The third step happens at the rapture. We get to heaven, glorified body, fully sanctified, heart, mind, body, soul. Now, you know what speeds up the process? The Word of God active in our lives. And when we meditate upon it, it's not hard to tell someone that's meditating upon the Word of God because it's transforming their life. You know why meditation on God's Word will transform your life? Because obviously it's going to produce godliness, but it's going to produce a gratitude in you. People lie. People tell you, oh, I love God's Word. I meditate on God's Word. And they're ingrates. That's impossible. The more you meditate, the more you're overwhelmed by the goodness of God and the greatness of God and the grace of God, and you're filled with a gratitude towards the people of God. That becomes a meditation. You know why it's hard for kids to be thankful? They haven't mastered the art of meditation. What are you thankful for? I don't know. Mom, first thing they see, the first person they see, the first food they see. You talk to an adult that's meditated a little bit? I'm thankful I didn't have to go to the doctor this month. Thankful my knees don't hurt. My back doesn't ache as much. And when they say they're thankful for their wife, it's not the pat answer of a 22-year-old because they say, that woman has put up with me for 22 years. And she's done my laundry and she's cooked my food. She's followed me around the world put up with my crazy ideas and still think she loves me, praise God for retardation. 
I'm not talking about myself. That wasn't my testimony. <laughs> because we've been married 26 years. I was talking about one of someone in here that's been married 22 years, in case you didn't catch that. <laughs> Meditation will transform your life. Amen. So tonight, I'm inviting you on a journey with your pastor. We're going through the book of Joshua. Let's just start out with Joshua 1.8. Meditate. What if you just got in the book of Joshua, you saturated, marinated your mind and your heart and your soul, and you woke up and you read until God spoke and you stopped. And you took that thought and you spent the whole day just mumbling. You mumble, you mutter, you speak it, and by the end of the day, it's become part of you. God, I want to live this. I want you to be glorified by your word in me. The Capital City Baptist Church is located at 1300 Red Street in beautiful Austin, Texas. We'd invite you to join us if you're in town. 10 a.m. Sunday mornings, 6 p.m. Sunday night, and 7.30 each and every Wednesday evening. Our phone number is 512-447-9454, but I'd like to point your attention specifically to our website, capitalcitybaptist.org. There you'll find information regarding service times, and the staff, and all about Capital City Baptist Church. Additionally, you can find an archive of previously preached messages there for you to download, enjoy, and pass on to friends and family. Again, that website is capitalcitybaptist.org. That's capital with an O, citybaptist.org. Be sure and tell a friend and do your best to join us again for Pulpit Echoes, a ministry of the Capital City Baptist Church.